All right, well, um, I wanna welcome everybody here to uh, EPEW 2021. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Julie Miller. I'm one of the committee members um, for EPEW and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, we have the great Andy Milne here today presenting on health ed ideas that worked in the toughest of years. So great information we can all use. Um, We'll keep everybody muted uh, during the session, um, but um, Andy said he's great to take questions along the way. Feel free to use the chat um, to post questions or comments or, um, you know, just participate in this session. Um, let's see. Yeah, and if you have any questions, like I said, please make sure they get answered. Um, if you do any posts today, Please use the hashtags EPEW2021 and EPEW family. Um, we, this is a great place to be, and we're really happy you're all here. And I'm going to now turn it over to Mr. Andy Milne. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you catch me zooming from my dining room, which is where I spent probably three quarters of the school year last year. Zooming from here and not being face to face with my students, and it was a it was a tough year. Uh, that was my twenty fifth year of teaching, hands down the toughest year I ever had. Uh, much tougher than my first ever years of teaching, uh, and I hope that off the back of it, there are there were things that have made us better teachers. I think we're going to admit that it was it was a tough year, all right. And I think it's okay to acknowledge that, and it's okay to kind of take a lot of time this summer and con uh, concentrate on self care and recharge those batteries and not even think about school. So kudos to anybody, you know, to you who are here. I appreciate you being here. I'm gonna bounce to share my screen. Um, so let me do that right now. I was so, I was so fluent at, um, at using Zoom during the school year and, and now I'm worried that I've forgotten everything. So let me bounce to my, my Canva. I pre I'm presenting to you today, uh, I use Canva to um, create my, my slides and create a lot of my school uh, resources as well. It gets, sorry, it's taken a while to, to open up. Um, it's a great way for me to embed live links. Here we go, here's my presentation today. At the same time, if any of my sharing isn't working, like right now on my screen, I can see some faces. If at your end you're seeing gray boxes, then please do let me know. Um, also in the, here we go, da, 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 just waiting for the present option to open up for me. Here we go. So the first thing hopefully you'll see is that there is a link there, bit.ly backslash EPEW Milne. It's just opening up. Here we go, present. Things are a bit slow at my end. If you click on that link, oh, sorry, not if you click on that link. If you, if you go to that link, um, that will give you access to my, my slideshow. Everything I'm sharing today uh, is available for you. I'm, I think in education, I'd like to give away as much as possible for free. Um, none of this material is necessarily mine. I'm very much a magpie when it comes to teaching. I, I take the best bits from everybody and those of you who share things online, thank you. And then I tweak them and make them work for my particular uh, situation so that they work for my kids. I'm hoping that today what I'm sharing uh, will be instantly uh, adaptable for your situation and for your students. What works for my kids might not work for your kids. I know my kids, I know them best, I know what works for them. So if you go to bit.ly backslash EPEW Milne, all capitalized, that would take you to my Canva presentation. Save that, then you've got access to everything here. There's a picture of me very proudly in my England jersey. What a shame that we lost yesterday to Italy. So I know Kim's a big soccer fan. She'll know what I'm saying. If you want to track me down, you're, you can do so through any of these links. Uh, and again, all of these are live. If I hover my, my cursor over these, Slow Chat Health is my blog. Um, please do check it out. There's an absolute, there's five years worth of amazing blog posts out there from myself and other educators. I'm on Twitter a lot, probably a little bit too much. Uh, you can find me as Carmel Health. I used to teach at a Catholic school called Carmel and I used to teach health. So oh, I did teach health at Carmel. So I'm Carmel Health. Uh, Pinterest, anytime something catches my eye or somebody shares some awesome content, I throw it up on Pinterest. 
I've got a ton of uh, boards on there. There's health ones, there's sex ed ones. My favorite one is my brain and activity. If I ever see a resource that links um, activity to enhanced brain, uh, social emotional health, I, I throw that in there as well. There's like 170 pins just there. If you're looking for resources to share with stakeholders or students, um, go check out my Pinterest boards. Uh, I'm on Instagram as Carmel Health. Um, a little bit. And then there's additional links down there as well. You can find me um, pretty much everywhere. I wonder if in the chat, if you are on social media, particularly Twitter, and you want to share your, your handle, feel free to do so in the chat. I know there's ways in which we can archive the chat. If not, you can also make a note and follow everybody. I can see that the chat is looking lively already. I'm going to take a little look here. Oh, good to see people. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. The link is case sensitive. Good, we've got a couple of people there as well. I think it's really good um, for us to build a community of, of health teachers. And oftentimes I'm asked for um, the names of really good elementary and middle school health teachers. And I don't know so many of those because I don't swim in that, in that ocean. So um, it's good for you all to keep in touch um, and obviously be part of the EPEW family. Thank you to the EPEW family for inviting me. Um, big shout out to Matt Bassett and then Shelby and Julie and everybody else who continues to put this, um, this uh, opportunity on for free. Um, a lot of today's sessions and the previous sessions are available to you online as well. Um, so feel free to check those out and share. So uh, let, me, let me just bounce back so that, that doesn't get in the way. Uh, just to quickly explain my situation, I'm currently teaching at, and I hope I will until I retire, uh, at New Trier High School, a wonderful school in the suburbs by Lake Michigan, just outside of, um, outside of Chicago. 4,000 students over two campuses. I'm on the bigger of the two campuses, 3,000 kids on my campus. I have a health and PE department of 36 individuals. So if I ever need any help, I got a, a, a whole crew of people who can help me out. Um, on, although I was very fortunate, uh, like him, to be awarded National Health Teacher of the Year, I'm not even the only, I'm not only the only National Teacher of the Year in my department. I work alongside Andy Horn, who's a Health Teacher of the Year, and we have two National Dance Teachers of the Year in the department as well. So I am very, very fortunate, not only in the kids that I teach, the people that I work with, the administration that I, that I work under, and, and I, I love teaching. 26 years in, I'm as excited now as, as ever before. Feel free in the chat to just share where you are currently working and maybe how many years you have under your belt. I'm sure there's a few of you have got uh, more years than my 26. So, Matthew said, can you present? And I said, yeah, sure, what do you want? And he said, anything you want. So I threw it out there. I said, well, let's just talk about the pandemic. And to be honest, I don't wanna talk about the pandemic. I don't want it to go away. I've hated it. But I want to acknowledge that although the pandemic was tough for many of us, not only us, but students as well there must be lessons learned all right there must be some positives that we can take from it so I've identified five or six things that I think resonated with me that I know will make me a better teacher next year and then off the back of that I've shared some three resources so three slides three resources um, that maybe uh, builds upon that so the first thing is the relationships we know that teaching is all about relationships it always has been if you don't have a relationship with your students, you're never gonna be an effective, um, an effective educator or as effective as you possibly could do. And I know that we work so hard remotely to try and get to know our kids. Um, and that was so, so very tough. And the one thing I look forward to when we, when we return and we will return um, with everybody back in the building uh, in the new school year, I'm looking forward to making direct eye contact. I'm looking forward to those fist bumps if I'm allowed to. Every time I walk from one part of the building to the other, those, those individual connections with kids, they allow me to level up. I'm literally, I'm Super Mario collecting rings as I go from one part of the building to the other. Every connection with a kid is another ring, another ring. And by the time I reach my office, I've leveled up again. So that's how I approach life. I, I live life gamefully. And I kind of took that from, um, oh shoot, what's Super Better, the book Super Better. I love the book Super Better by one of the McGonagall twins. We know the heart before head is so important. Connect before content. When we get back, I'm going to spend even more time getting to know my students. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of wide-eyed, kind of slightly stunned individuals in the building who will find it strange to be back in, you know, in real school. Um, so I think we have to acknowledge that we've gone through this shared experience uh, and make sure that our students feel safe and secure uh, 
uh, so that we can then move forward and learn. All of the skills that you developed over the last 18 months or so, you've honed those skills, you've sharpened those skills. So we, we really need to put them into action right now. Um, so I, I, making connections with kids uh, as an ongoing process is so, so very, very important. I wanna share this with you. This is something that I did um, last academic year and it worked really well for me. I created, I'm gonna click here, click here. This is gonna bounce to my Google, Google Locks. So using, an, using Canva, using live links, I shared this with my students. It's a little uh, presentation that I embedded and put into Canvas. We use Canvas as our LMS. I know, I know Kim, you do as well. If I click here, I put this interactive slideshow together and shared it with my students before school had started. All of these are live links. You just, you just select the square and embed a live link. A quick hello if you want to hear more about me. Uh, there's a video. Hi, I'm Mr. Milne. That's before I had pandemic hair. If I go back, you can learn a little bit more about me. So this was a great opportunity for students already to hopefully know that they, um, they have similarities with me and maybe get excited. I'm just clicking as I'm talking here. These are some of the books I was reading this time last year. If you haven't read Why We Sleep, it would change your life. Um, some music that I like to listen to, my Spotify playlists. I'll go back to the go home again. So literally it's a slideshow. You can make these in Google Slides uh, and then embed live links as well. I don't know if anybody's got any, uh, any questions about that. But like I said, it's a chance for, and, there, and there, it, sorry, within, within that, let me bounce back. Within that, there was actually a survey as well. If you take this- Hi, I'm Mr. Milne. Stop. If you take this survey, um, it takes students about three or four minutes to fill it out. Um, but then what happens is I get bounced um, a summary of their responses. So at the start of the school year, I'd print out my roster and I'd go through their responses and I would identify um, where I have where I have like a, a similar have had a similar experience with my students. So if they're into music or they've done some community service or they've lived overseas, I'd make a little note of that. So then if I was ever looking for a connection with students, I could go back to those notes and that would be my, my way in. Um, I think if you can find a way in which to almost like unlock or, or, or get, get into a student, it's a way in which you can um, be so much more productive uh, in the school year. Let me check the chat, see if there's any, any, uh, any comments here. Okay, I see people sharing those links. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, next one. Um, and like I said, this is all, this is all uh, available for you. I want to I wanna talk a little bit about getting an A in life. Um, I used to do this activity, or I still do this activity, where I say to students, health class is going to be cut from the curriculum because the administrators want to focus on more academic subjects. I need you to write a couple of paragraphs advocating for health. You could do this for PE as well, because I know some of you had your PE programs cut within the last 18 months. And just see what students write. Um, great opportunity for them to develop their advocacy skills. Obviously, that's one of our national health standards. A student many years ago um, wrote, in health class, it's not about getting an A in class, it's about getting an A in life. And it resonated so much with me that that's kind of become my mantra now. I'm not that concerned about the grade that you get in my class. If you want an A, you can take the A right now. My students are so compliant. They literally, they do what I ask them to do, all right? So they're playing the game, but the A, the, the grade isn't that important. I want my students to know, and I want the parents of my students to know that I'm hoping to develop the skills that they need to la navigate school, college, and beyond. I want to give them the skills that they need to be successful in their relationships with friends and family. I want them to be able to understand what it means to be healthy. And then can they look around and see where health is lacking? Can they help their, their friends and family make healthier choices? Um, can families get together and advocate for um, better health awareness within the community? And I think that's important. So I tell my kids, it's all about getting an A in life. So I do this activity here. That's the quote there. That's a quote, that's a, a, a writing prompt. And I say to my students, when it's all done and dusted, what do you want people to say about you? When, you? when you've lived that healthy life and you've got that A in life, what do you want people to, how do you want people to talk about you? And what this does is it allows students to write quite freely about their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations in life. 
and they tell me about their their the, the careers they want to go into and and their hopes of you know for raising a family or giving back to community one i get to know my students just a little bit more but two i can then say to my kids well it looks like you've just given me what your a in life looks like right you've told me this is how you want to be remembered this is that a that you're hoping to achieve i can then say to them does your current behavior is it in is it in alignment with the A that you're looking for. If you want this, you want to achieve this, but you're behaving in this way, or you're making these choices, does the, you know, is that going to allow you to be as, as successful as you want? If you click on the link down here in the bottom right-hand corner, um, I give you some slides and the prompt, and I reflect a little bit more. I even share some student examples as well about, about what the students have, have, have written. This is a wonderful way for you to get to know your students, what they're hoping to get in, out of life in general, and then allows you to tailor your teaching to make sure that you're helping them and you're guiding them in that journey to the A in life. And one more thing here, one more way in which I make connections. I love making connections with um, activities like this. This is a poster that I would switch out regularly um, outside my classroom. I like to share what I'm reading, what I'm watching, and what I'm listening to. And I ask that of my students as well. It's a great way to check in in the morning. Hey, is anybody binging anything on Netflix right now? Uh, who's reading a great book? I love it when students have like English texts on their desk or they're secretly reading it under the desk while I'm trying to talk to them. Um, I, I connect with my students. One really successful way in which I connected and each of these links is live. If you have a Spotify account, it could be free or it can be paid. You can check out what my students are listening to uh, with one of the class, one semester, I said, hey, give me a list of all the songs that make you feel good. I learn a lot about my students. I get to learn a little bit more about some of the music they're listening to. And I promise you, every time I hear a certain song, it reminds me of that one kid who suggested that one song. Um, so it, it just keeps my students in my, in my thoughts um, a lot. This one was, um, I said, hey, sh share the music that, um, that you listen to when you want to just kind of chill out and be reflective and be mindful. It's a wonderfully uh, chill playlist. I got a real kick out of the fact I went into another classroom and the teacher was playing this playlist to her students. Uh, and then finally, when I'm presenting in person, uh, I like to play um, very generic um, instrumental music, just as people are coming in and gathering. If you wanna see my conference beats, it's mostly hip hop and soul and funk. Um, but I, but, but to, to connect, with students, this way is very simple and it's easy to share as well. Um, you can build upon these in any way. Um, Breath was a great book. It was actually suggested by a mum. She, I was teaching online about breathing and mindfulness and a mum overheard and then she emailed me and said, hey, I was listening into your Zoom lesson the other day. I wonder if you checked out the book Breath. So I read it. Uh, so I got to make a connection with parents as well. So that was, that was pretty cool. All right, which takes me to this uh, first of our pauses. I just want to check and see if anybody's got anything they want to add to that. What did you do um, this year that was a, a really good way to bond with your students, connect with your students? Feel free to unmute yourself and, and, and talk. Because if not, I'll just keep going. Well, <clears throat> hey, Andy. Uh, my students, um, they're in a, a special needs school. Okay. And also they really... Uh, weren't connecting with their friends because they just weren't able to. Um, and uh, what I did was they knew I, I chimed on at 8.30. So from 8.30, I had kids already chiming into my uh, PE um, slot. So they would talk, they would just hang out with me while I was setting up from 8.30 to nine. And then they knew my last class was at 2.30. So all of a sudden I'd get more of them coming in at 2.30 and all and then we also did like a PE jam day where we just listened to music or we they knew like Thursdays we'd watch a movie and we just hang out for like an hour after school so they got to hang out with friends from other classes love it I love it that resonates with me if I could have got to my emojis I'd have given you a heart emoji there I used to use the heart <laughs> emojis and give kids a chance to kind of that's really cool. Um, other things I do is I, I, whenever I print my roster out at the end of the year, I also make sure I've got their dates of birth. So anytime a student had the date a birthday, um, I always acknowledge that. If I'm teaching them that day, well, maybe we'll sing happy birthday if they, if they don't mind me doing that. 
or I would just send them an email. Hey, it's your birthday this weekend. Um, have a wonderful birthday as well. Also, I, I would end my Zooms with, hey, we're done right now, but if you want to stick around for some bonus content, feel free to do so. And you would just get kids who want to hang out. So um, I had one boy get his trumpet and start playing the trumpet for me. So uh, <laughs> Shelby says, yes, birthdays. Birthdays are a wonderful way to connect. All right, so let's move on. Uh, what's my next thing here? Students are more aware of health than ever before. Oh, absolutely. I mean, students are now discussing health because of the pandemic. Uh, students are so much more aware of, of the need to attend to social and emotional health. My students want to talk about mental health more so than ever before. And if, and if we don't have those conversations, they'll call me out on it. Um, so I think we need to just uh, latch on to that. Students are really, really thinking of health. And I, I am finding that students less so think that health is just about eating right and working out. <clears throat> I think there was a time when that's all they thought it was right. Okay, have, have, have a good diet, <laughs> work out, maybe look good. Um, and I think they know that there's more than that. Now, I used to talk about the health triangle, mental, emotional, social, and physical, but now I talk about the 10 dimensions of wellness because I think my students are ready for that. My students are good. They're academic, um, they're, 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 they're easy to engage. So I think my students can cope with the 10 dimensions of wellness. You might choose the seven dimensions of wellness. There's, there's different ways, there's different understandings of what it means to be healthy and well. And I think that's okay. Health is different things to different people. Um, so I think once you understand what health and wellness looks like in your classroom, you can move on. But I think it's important for you to have that conversation initially. And I don't think we should say to students, this is what health looks like, because that might not be what it looks like in your community. And I want students to think that we're all there together. All right, we all have something to bring to the, to the table. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. I'm not the sage on the stage, all right? I don't have all the answers and I learn as much from my students as I hope they learn from me. So there's not one teacher and 30 students, there's 31 students in this class. And I, I, let, I empower my students to feel confident in teaching me something, sharing a resource with me, or, or leading a conversation. If they wanna do a presentation to the, to the class on something, then I'll let them do that. That last point, explore the health topics in your school and local community. I'm hoping that you've got local data. I'm hoping that you're aware of specifically what your school community needs and what your local community needs. In my community, binge drinking is, is an area of concern. Uh, that's our drug of choice. We're a very liberal community, um, but, but uh, engaging in sexual activity, uh, teen pregnancies, that's not so much of an issue within my community, probably because it gets in the way of homework uh, at my academic school. Uh, my colleagues in Minneapolis will talk about uh, sex trafficking, um, whereas that, that's not on my, on my uh, I don't teach that content, okay? So I, I make sure that I attend to um, the content that's needed uh, for my students. And often that's based on, on data that I have. All right, so look at the data. Image on the top right-hand corner with the Trevians, that's our mascot. In the chat, tell me what your school mascot is. So I talk about being healthy Trevians, okay? My wife teaches at Barrington, they're the Broncos. So she'll talk about, or she could talk about being healthy Broncos or healthy Phillies <laughs> because they've got gendered mascots. Um, so that, I, I frame that, okay? That's an image that I share. It's on my coffee mug right now. It just happens to be on my water bottle as well. Um, so we're all, I talk about being the healthy Trevian. So I might not say, uh, I might not say, what does it mean for you to be healthy? I might say, what does a healthy Trevian look like? How would a healthy Trevian behave? I love to use movement. I'll talk about that a little bit later on, but I love to use movement. Send your students on a walk and talk. What's the biggest health concern facing? Hang on, I need to go back to the chat now because I want to see some of these mascots. The sharks, the giants, the eagles, the seahawks, the cyclones, the hornets, the bobcats. All right, so Kirsten's the sharks. So she might pair up her students and say, right, let's go on a walk and talk. We're going to walk a small lap of the building. Great opportunity for teachers to see health class out and about. And while we're walking, I want you to discuss what do you think the biggest health concerns are facing the sharks right now? All right, and off they go and then they come back and you've had all these mini conversations about, about to be what it means to be a healthy shark. Isn't it shark week this week? To be a healthy shark. And then you can start feeding all that data, putting it on the board and you can start to see what your students are thinking because they're thinking about it right now. 
I also like the walk and talk because I've got sophomores. What did your previous health teacher want you to know about health? I want to know what message was being pushed. My students come from different sender schools, different feeder schools. So they've got different messages. There's one school that doesn't talk about sex ed. It just, just doesn't, it just doesn't. And there's another one that talks about it a lot. What about those students who have come from out of states? Okay, what about those students who have had a different experience? There's another opportunity right now to kind of acknowledge that our students are coming from different backgrounds. So they're bringing different experiences into the room. And obviously the more we harness those experiences, the more enriched our classroom is gonna be and the more enriched our conversations is gonna be. Um, this is another prompt, a uh, great little short writing prompt that you could send your kids right now. Maybe they could take this home and have that conversation with, with the, the people at home. In what ways are you intentionally engaging in health enhancing behaviors? Because students might come to health class thinking, whoa, you're talking about 10 dimensions of wellness. And I, you know, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm healthy. Well, I want to find out what are you intentionally doing right now? Are you trying to go to bed early? Are you making an effort to eat more healthfully? Um, do you and your family like to be active? When I start to get those short prompts and I read every single one, because I'll never give students a writing task without reading every single word. When I read that, again, I know much more about my students and their families and the way in which they approach what it means to be healthy. Okay, so you might, you might learn about health interests and activity interests that wouldn't necessarily be talked about in, in, in school. So I love that as a writing prompt. And my final one here, if you, read, if you saw my blog post this morning, which I pushed out because of this presentation today, um, I, I want my students to see uh, health through many lenses. I want them to think about what does it mean to be healthy as an individual and with your family? What does it mean to be healthy within the local community? What does it mean to be healthy nationally? Is this different? Are our experiences different from those in surrounding communities? I've shared some slides there. They come from the MOT poll. That link in the bottom right-hand corner would take you to today's blog post. Um, the, blog says, the blog says something like, here's 20 health concerns. They asked parents, here's 20 health concerns, rank them. I say to my students, which ones are important in our community or which ones are prevalent in our community? Which ones do you think are prevalent across the country? And I get two different sets of, of, of responses, okay? My kids might say, um, binge drinking, uh, excessive time on the laptop and something else. But they might say nationally, ooh, racism, uh, gun control and diet. And then I'll say, right now, give me a compare and contrast. Why, why is there, where's the similarity? Where's the differences? How is it different living in our community to perhaps the experience of those around you? So there's another wonderful opportunity to see which of your kids see health in that wider lens. Which of the kids are already saying, well, I'm currently advocating for this health concern. I've, I've been raising awareness. Um, if you look at those slides, the results are actually different. When they, re when they re re uh, release the slides, uh, there's results from white parents, there's results from Hispanic parents, and there's results from black parents. Uh, black parents, that green one, racism, COVID, and social media, whereas the white families, everything was like tech related. Overuse of social media, bullying and cyberbullying, and internet safety, right? So that internet safety was your biggest concern last year. During a pandemic, that was your biggest concern while we still had systemic racism hitting the news on a daily basis. Now I can start weaving in conversations about social justice, all right? Just in a basic health class. Um, so now my kids know that I'm gonna start having those conversations as well. Those students who are looking for an ally, there is a pricking up, they're like, wait, wait, we're gonna go this deep in health? Absolutely. 95% of my students are gonna do the tasks I ask them to do. They're gonna get that A in class. The other 5% wanna take this and run with it. They wanna start advocating in the school, in the community and beyond. They're probably doing that work already. So I know that my, my health class works in, in so, many different, um, so many different levels. Uh, Kim says, examining health equity through different zip codes. Yeah, that this is it's wonderful, right? Health class, health is more than health class. Uh, nothing else in the chat right now. Feel free to use the chat. Anybody want to add to this? Kim, did you want to say something? I know you're in a hotel room. Are you able to say anything about how you might examine health equity through zip codes? I know Kim's in a hotel room, maybe not. Yeah, um, yeah, 
so my community it's pretty diverse um actually within the six different high schools so just using uh life examples like covid hit my community versus like the high school down the street no one knew anyone who had covid and so just using real life examples just within our community and how COVID has impacted the di our different communities within just our city. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then what a great, uh, what great proof that skills-based health is so much more effective. The content is going to change. All right, we wouldn't, I wouldn't have taught about the con the pandemic five years ago, but the skills that maybe we needed to navigate that and cope with that, they're going to be ongoing. All right, so it is the, the drug of choice will change. I wasn't talking about vaping five years ago and maybe five years from now, I won't be talking about vaping. The, the drugs are gonna come and go, but the skills, the refusal skills, the decision-making skills, the advocating for healthy behavior skills are always gonna be ongoing. So skills-based health really is, is so, so very powerful. A reminder, bottom left-hand corner, you check out bit.ly backslash E-P-E-W Milne, all capitalized you'll have an opportunity to access this presentation. All of these links are live, all of them are live. There's PD for days. All right, next thing I learned during the pandemic, a return to school means we can refine how we teach. Less busy work, more meaningful work, incorporating movement and collaboration. Right, so I think we worked very hard, right? We can acknowledge that, pat ourselves on the back. We worked so hard during the pandemic and many of us created those asynchronous resources, right? Those worksheets, maybe you did some videos, uh, maybe you did some tasks that you were able to push out to students so they could work asynchronously, word of the year, I guess, uh, work asynchronously and then submit stuff back to us. Don't think that you can discard those now. You worked so hard to create those asynchronous resources to so put them in your tool belt or whatever you wanna do um, and, and use those. First thing, here we go. This is a live link to a wonderful blog post called No More Easy Button, a suggested approach to post-pandemic teaching. Jennifer Gonzalez of Cult of Pedagogy is outstanding. Her blog is wonderful. Her podcast is also wonderful. And here on the right-hand side, you can see that she's got so many other places that you can visit. Her blog post looks fairly similar to my presentation. I wanna say that I, I got there first, but, she, uh, but she's written this. This is her take on how we can take those lessons from the pandemic and move on. So if you click on this link, she talked about um, how we can, we can be much stronger and much more effective as educators moving into the pandemic. It's a wonderful read. Share it with your coworkers as well if they're looking to engage themselves and get fired up uh, about being more effective next year. Oh, shoot, I just clicked on the link and that's not what I wanted to do. Let's go back. Where are we? That, no, that one, boom. Here we go. She says, and I love this, less fluff, more meaningful. We can get rid of the busy work, all right? I know, I know we've all got, me too, we've got those activities and those lessons that we love to teach because, I don't know, they're just fun and whatever. They, we, we love to teach them. We probably, have, we need to prioritize and we need to make those the third on our list. There's things we must teach. There are things I must teach because the state of Illinois mandates it. Big shout out to California because I love what you have mandated, all right? Especially the work that you do on, on consent. So there's things you must teach. There's the things you should teach. I should teach about binge drinking because it's a real concern in my community based on the data that I have access to. So I have to teach that. And then if I've got any time left over, then maybe I can throw in some of those fluffy, fun activities that I like to do but they're the least important. They're, that's my fluff, okay? That's, that's not where I need to go. I think we need to choose the things that are most important and just take time, go deeper, make sure that your students really get this material. There's a link here to a post from Amy Pryor. Amy Pryor is an outstanding educator on the East Coast. And she wrote a blog post for me. In fact, I'm gonna click on that because she shared everything. If you're looking to get fired up about next year, and I'm just scrolling through here, Amy shares her thoughts. She tells you exactly where to go. If you're blowing up your curriculum and starting all over again, she tells you how to do it. She, she, she uses her methods. She's got live links to everything going in here. Um, so that's an outstanding, outstanding resource. 
that blows up for me on my on my blog uh, every year. So please, if you're looking for some, I'm sorry, if you're, if you're looking for some, um, uh, I'm clicking the wrong link. No, here. Looks like every time I click the links, I go out of my presentation. Uh, please take time uh, and read Amy Pryor's wonderful uh, blog post. Also, now that we're back in the classroom, let's, let's do what I love best, use movement. We, we now get a chance to have movement in the room. We can get students switching desks and making small groups. Uh, we can get students collaborating again, collaborating online, on Zoom, on Google Hangouts. It was so, so very difficult. I'm a huge fan of using movement to make my lessons more engaging, more memorable. Uh, and as I move to 85 minute block periods next school year, there's no way I'm having them sitting down on a desk, on a, on a chair for 85 minutes. When your bum is numb, your brain is drained, all right? Engage your students and get them up and get them walking. I share all of my thoughts in this blog post here, the kinesthetic movement, and then in this one, more movement in the classroom. Um, I was inspired by Mike Kajala, and I share links to his, um, his resources there. What are we doing for time? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am gonna move on, but I promise you there's so much good stuff in here, including downloadable links for some of my, for some of my lessons. Um, asynchronous flexibility. Um, I create all of my materials in, in Canva. I'm gonna share some choice boards with you right now. But the good thing about um, something like this, this resource I'm about to share with you is that you can push that asynchronous material out, let the bulk of your students just work by themselves, themselves self-paced learning as you can then attend to those students that need a little bit more time perhaps they need a little bit more time or just a little bit more input from you or just a little bit of additional feedback to make sure that they practice skills and they understand your content so here's an example of a couple of things again if you click on these from my down from my my uh, slideshow each of these individual squares will take you to live links so i played around with choice boards you can create these in Google, uh, on Google Slides. I create them in Canva. I was, I was pushing the gratitude uh, message for a while. So I would say to students, hey, access three of these resources. Tell me what you learned. Uh, tell me how you might uh, embrace this information and use it in life going forward. I did a brain and exercise one for my PE class as well. I like to hit my students uh, on, a different, on, on different levels. So I've got readings, I've got viewings, and I've got listenings, all right? Podcasts, TED Talks, and then a wealth of different act, uh, things to read here as well. Just have my students um, review and feed back to me. I'll just give you a quick uh, pointer, bottom left-hand corner there. It really breaks my heart that sometimes teachers give these out as a, as a tool for their students. And there are some school districts out there that don't allow their Gmail accounts to access um, information from outside of the network and it breaks my heart because there's nothing I can do about it there's nothing I can do um I can't even email those kids and say hey try a different email because they won't accept my they won't accept my incoming email so sometimes in very rare occasions these don't work um oh shoot I clicked the wrong link let me go back to here next page I love this um this kept me on my toes for black history month um, I wanted to put together health-related resources, again, readings, viewings, listenings, that attended to health-related content throughout the month of February. Obviously, we don't have these conversations just in, in February. Um, but I tried to share a little bit about the Black experience in terms of their, the, the relationship with health and the medical community. Uh, and oftentimes that's quite a negative experience. And I try to pair that up with something positive. So there's a lot here for you to access. That is uh, 28, so that's four, that's 56 different resources um, that just allow you to weave in and embed conversations about social justice and disparity and inequity in a health, in a health lesson. Um, so I'm gonna let Jennifer Wilson in. So that's there for you to check out. Um, it's something I'm proud of, uh, and I really need to do more of these um, for different themed months as well. Uh, click. Anybody else want to share ways in which they uh, in which they kind of hit this? I'd love to know. Did anybody have any asynchronous uh, opportunities? Does anybody like to use uh, movements? 
Any good movement? Uh, oh, thank you, Kim, for sharing the new California Health, health Framework. A big shout out to my friend, Christopher Pepper, who's one of my favorite California educators. I believe he got married this week. That's why you're not seeing him on social media this week. All right, there's no conversations, no comments. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. Cause I know we've got, and I am gonna overrun. So feel free to stick around afterwards. I'm not going anywhere. Um, assessment doesn't have to be scary. I never tell my kids I'm giving them tests or quizzes. We don't have any tests or quizzes in my health classroom. All I'm giving them is an opportunity to tell me what they know. All right, you've learned this content. You, you've practiced these skills. Show me in action. Show me what you know, all right? So I, I never use those words, tests and quizzes, um, because it scares students and immediately gets them anxious. And then they come into that, that test opportunity, yeah, and they've been tested everywhere in other parts of the building. I don't want my students to feel this way. Just tell me what you know. And because health is so personal, your assessments can be so very personal as, personal as well. Uh, in those bullet points there, I like that third one, practice makes progress. Health skills are all about practice. In my goal setting lessons with my students, am I gonna make sure that they now can set the world's most amazing goals and hit them every time? No, all I'm doing is giving them an opportunity to continue practicing, practicing, practicing. In my decision-making lessons, I'm giving them a chance to practice a decision-making model in a safe environment. When they go into the real world and they go to that party or wherever they're at with their friends, at least they can recall that time in health class where they were able to slowly go through a model and make the ideal, um, the ideal decision. So they've got that, they've got something to fall back on. Just like a coach practices layups before you go into a game, I like to think that skills-based health is all about practicing the skills. So when you go into the game of life, you're just a little bit more confident and you're just a little bit more successful. I'm 50 years old and I'm still making bad decisions on a daily basis. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all a work in progress. Let's take a look at my things here, right? So here's an example um, of me testing, I guess, my students. I have the Trevian Health Tribune and I make up these questions. And the questions are always from imaginary Trevians. So here on the left-hand side, confused at nths.net says, my partner wants to take our relationship to the next level. There's non-gendered language right there. My partner wants to take our relationship to the next level. They say that everyone is doing it. What, what's it? And if I love would have sex. Are they, can you give me some advice? Hashtag YRBS, check out the youth risk behavior survey. So really I'm asking students for their thoughts. I'm asking for their communication skills. I'm asking for proof that they can advocate for healthy behaviors and healthy choices but I've written it in a way so they can, as a student, you can become a teen journalist and you can write in the style of a teen journalist if you want. So you're kind of distancing yourself from the personal and then you can show what you know, okay? I, I give two points uh, for two separate pieces of good information. So this is an example. I just took a screen grab of one of my students. They have quoted uh, our YRBS data which is really good. And I can see here, they've given two good pieces of information. I'm happy with the information that they've given. So therefore two points for the question. If you click on the link down here in the bottom right-hand corner, it will give you um, six questions from this specific Trevian Health Tribune. You can make it the Giants Health Tribune or the Shark Health Tribune. Uh, Judy, 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 huge. Tell me what you know has given me wonderful insight as to what my students value, learn and retain. That's all it is, right? Show me what you know. I don't care how you show me. You might not be a great writer. Maybe you, you, you clam up when it comes to writing and the piece of writing you turn in isn't very good. All right, I'll call that student over and say, hey, what did you mean by this? Because I don't think you've given me enough. If you were in this situation right now, what would you say? And maybe verbally, they give me the answer that I was looking for. All right, I'll take that as the evidence and I'll give you the grade that it's worth. It doesn't bother me. If you show me what you know through interpretive mind, as long as you show me what you know, okay, and it, and it hits all those standards or it hits my, my rubric, just show me what you know, whether that be a poster, a podcast, a conversation, all right, it's, it's okay. I threw the FIT, uh, the FIT acronym in there, um, just as, <laughs> because I know some of us teach PE as well. What was your approach to assessment last year? And I wonder if you assessed less. 
I wonder if you were more, uh, if you weren't as intense with your grading. I definitely didn't, didn't, didn't give any zeros last year. I wonder if you're more flexible with your due dates. I was, because kids were juggling a million things. And I wonder if you decided to assess in multiple ways. I, and maybe this is a personal choice, I am happy to take late work. And I'm also, and, and we definitely did during the pandemic, and I won't necessarily punish you. So I've said, said there's 10 points available. Maybe I'll give you nine points. You're still going to get the A. Maybe that one little ding just shows that you, you didn't turn it in on time. But I know that Kim might get it now. She might understand decision-making now. And Kate might not get it till next week when all of a sudden it clicks. That's okay. And does that mean that sometime at the end of the year, I get this flurry of late work? Absolutely. But I'm not here to catch students out. I just want to teach you, work with you, and then, then create that body of evidence and say, here, I know this kid is an A-grade student. I know it, and here's the proof. So, so I don't know if anybody's got any, anything against that and, or wants to argue against that. And I know some schools have different policies, and I feel that that's a shame, okay? I, I, it's health class, all right? I just need them to get that A in life. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and chime in if you want. Uh, this is where it goes with, I won't assess until I know you're ready. So I tell my students, I wouldn't give you this opportunity to show me what you know if I didn't think you were ready. I wouldn't put you in the game as a basketball player if I didn't think you were ready to play the game. So when it comes to skills, I'll introduce the skill and I'll model the skill, all right? So it's all me. Then we'll practice it together. So it's us. Then I'll let the kids work together so they're practicing together. And then they'll practice some more. And then when they're ready, then maybe the assessment comes. And if you didn't turn it in, you weren't, you weren't happy with the grade that you got, then turn it in again and make it better. On the left-hand side, these are slightly old and I definitely want to improve these. These are some decision-making scenarios. Each of these is an opportunity for me to give this scenario to a group of students, okay? And apply our decision-making model to this scenario. Tell me what your response was. Now apply it to a different scenario and a third scenario. Okay, now apply the decision-making model to a time when you had to make a difficult decision. All right, so you've practiced, practiced, practiced. Now put it in action, all right? They're so ready to apply this. And then I get wonderful, wonderful responses. And again, I learn a little bit more about the students. I'm just checking here. Being flexible is equitable. That's wonderful, Kim. I like that. Judy loves that phrasing as well. Anybody want to want to chime in on that on that point about assessments opportunities? I, know I actually, when I did some asynchronous um, classes, I had a lot of kids who were artists, and I started including drawing. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get some you know so-so answers. I got tremendous answers. Uh, I mean, even complex things like consent um, or even health. And like I said, just show me what you know. And my school supports that. And you can actually, I can actually unequivocally say, I know what they know. And with, with a really good um, rate of confidence, so. Absolutely. I can picture one student I had a couple of years ago and she didn't speak in class. But when I did an art related uh, opportunity, she did the most amazing uh, stuff. And that made me realize there's more to this. I really need to em embrace those students. My drama kids love role play, all right? My arty kids love that. <laughs> All right, here we go. Be, 100, be there for 100% of your students, 100% of, of the time. Make sure your resources are inclusive and make sure your students see themselves, okay? Make sure all the examples you give represent the community that you're there. If you ever give names, I like to use non-gendered names. Maybe you'll use names that are common in your community. If you're ever sh sharing images, make sure those images represent the makeup of your community as well. Um, this was, uh, I think there's a tweet that I pushed out a while ago, and I think it's right. Our teaching flex spaces need to be as inclusive as possible so all of our students see themselves in the curriculum and feel safe and respected as teachers model the behavior and the language that they expect from all present. I don't think I was that teacher as a PE teacher 20 years ago in London. I don't think I was that person. I don't think I was inclusive enough. I definitely gravitated towards the jocks. I definitely gravitated towards my favorite students and shame on me for being that person. And now I'm there for a hundred percent of my kids. And if, and if one student isn't being successful, then I need to do more to try and help that student. And if I can't do it, then I need to reach out to the kid, 
the family, the carers, the social workers, the advisor, the case manager. All right, I, I need to, I can't, I can't, I can't solve all of the, of the, I don't have all of the answers, but somebody working with that, that student must have some information that helps me allow them to be more successful in my classroom. Uh, this link, this is actually taken from a Shape America document. The bottom right hand corner is the link to that. Uh, so these bullet points, um, Shape reached out to some educators and said, what are, you, what are your, uh, your, your, your points that you think everyone should know about equity, diversity and inclusion in the health and PE space? So this is their work. Um, and then um, this was, uh, the, okay, so th this is a blog post that I wrote about using non-gendered language using person-centered language and, and having that conversation with my students as well so that my language is is as inclusive as it, as possible at all times i still catch myself talking to my students and saying hey guys let's do this thing and i know that hey guys doesn't doesn't necessarily uh, speak to everybody in the building so i'm trying to do more and i let my students know they can they can call me out okay if i use language that isn't inclusive in my school we have the following affinity groups, right? Because we're well-resourced and, 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 and we're that kind of school. So my students who are looking to get together with other kids who are, have a shared experience and want to have safe conversations in a safe environment, they can go to these organizations here. And very often they've been set up by students. Um, they're led by teachers who, who um, also al align with these particular affinity groups. Um, my Muslim Student Association put together Ramadan resources for teachers so that they could be more inclusive during that month of Ramadan. Um, so my kids are, are good at advocating. We have these opportunities for my students to, to advocate uh, in the community. Just a ton of resources here. These are all live links. These are all live links. I just went out there to find out what I could to share with you. If this is a passion of yours, um, then you can take time to read any of these um, ways in which you can be as inclusive as possible, decolonize the curriculum, all of that good stuff. Anybody want to chime in here? I can see the chat's got, uh, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you, Kirsten. All right, Julie's giving the attendance certificate if you need to bounce. I know there's some other, other great opportunities out there. I've got one more little set of slides, so please stick around. Uh, share as much as you're able. Please, please, please share your awesomeness. Share your students' awesomeness. Share it with as many pieces of people as you possibly can, and then save that really good work to motivate the next group of students, to motivate yourself, or to provide somebody with the evidence that says, I'm a good teacher, because I'm giving my students the opportunity to create this amazing work, all right? Because I know we always, always have to, to prove that we're as good as we hope we are. Here's a quote from Rushton and Hurley. If students are sharing their work with the world, they want it to be good. If they're sharing it with you, just with you, they want it to be good enough. I've had work turned in. It's a grade A piece of work. And I've said, this is so good. Can I tweet this out? And kids are like, give it back to me right now. I can make it so much better. So please share that work. And then the good thing is I take the best of semester one. I show it to semester two. If all semester two has ever seen is the best that came before, that becomes their, their, their lowest, that becomes their bar. Well, if that's what Mr. Milne thinks is good, I'm gonna beat that. So I keep those resources until they've been surpassed and then the next one comes through and the next one comes through. That's why I like to have shareable assessments, shareable opportunities so that I can collate them digitally. Uh, please jump on social media. Um, I know we shared our, um, our social media handles a little bit earlier on. These are, these are some of the, the hashtags that you can jump on. I find that the social media community on Twitter is very inclusive and they want to help. I find that the social media community on Facebook, maybe not so much. Facebook is where my racist uncle lives. Okay, Twitter is where my people are, all right? I've collated that, that PLN. Um, I can't really necessarily collate who's in these particular groups on, on Facebook. So Facebook, less so. Sometimes Facebook disappoints me with the comments that are made from teachers, um, but Twitter is, is, is where I, I tend to gravitate. Shareable materials are awesome. You can share them with everybody, put them up in the classroom. I've got QR codes in my classroom. If you, if you scan it, it will take you to a podcast. Hear the voice of students from three years ago talking about condom access and why we should be providing 
better condom access in, in a high school scenario. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a blog post down here on the right hand side that you can, you can read more. Uh, anybody want to add anything to this? <laughs> Before I bounce to this last slide, this is where you'll find me. This is all live here. Remember that that link uh, that I shared earlier is available to you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I am going to close this out. I'm gonna stop my share. Boom. So we can all see each other. I'm here for questions. You can put questions in the in the in the chat. I'm here. I'm here. My family's gone for brunch, so that's nice and quiet. <laughs> Anybody? You're just like high school students. If you need to go, you can go. Um, if you need me, I'm here. If you want to email me, I'll get back to you within 24, 48 hours. If you've got any wonderful resources and you want, you want me to take a look at them or you want to share them, um, I'd love to see what, what greatness that you and your students are doing. If you ever wanted to write a blog post for slowchathealth.com, you can do so. I saw that thumbs up, Michael. That's so old school. The kids are like, what are you doing? That's an emoji. No, that's, that's, that's where it comes from, kids. Um, please stay in touch. We're so much better by being a family of educators. Um, I wish you a very restful summer vacation. I hope you can get some uh, a respite from the heat. I'll be in Kentucky. Yes. And I'll be in Kentucky next week for an in-person conference. You might see me at Shape New Orleans if my conference is, uh, if my proposal is, is uh, accepted. Um, but yeah, yeah, good luck. I started a new book uh, yesterday and I thought that you might like it. Tell me. It's called Quit Like a Woman. Quit Like a Woman? Yeah, by Holly Whitaker. The radical choice to not drink in a culture obsessed with alcohol. Ooh. And can you put that in the chat? Yeah. Um, it is, it's been, I'm up to chapter seven. And the first chapter is, uh, is titled The Lie, and then it goes on to toxic eyeliner and goop cocktails. So like, it it's, talks about how goop is like, oh, we, can't, we can't be sponsored by these cosmetic products because they've got all these toxins in it, but we'll be sponsored by like a, a higher end cocktail, which is like literally poison for your body. And then the um third chapter was alcohol is alcohol having a cigarette moment and it talks about how um you know cigarettes had to convince people that they were like sexy and edgy and whatever and so there was like this guy that taught hollywood how to frame cigarettes and like how like cigarettes became a fad because of Hollywood and all this stuff and how alcohol didn't need to do that. And so, you know, and it talks about how um, tobacco companies, they were like, um, what did they say? They were like, oh, the, we don't know what the research says. There's still, there's, we still don't know, right? And that was like their company line. And similarly, alcohol uses, please drink responsibly. So it's not like the advertiser, it's not the company's fault for um, promoting this lifestyle. It's your fault because you can't control it. And it's been, and, and the, um, then they go, she goes on to make this thesis that um, alcoholism and Alcoholics Anonymous is all male centered. And that like the 12 steps or whatever they're called in, in AA are like just 100% geared towards privileged white men. And like, they're addicted to having huge egos and like they need to be taken down a peg but when you introduce any sort of oppressed person into that system they already feel oppressed and now they're starting to realize they're and that's why they drink so now they're starting to realize that they don't want to be oppressed anymore so then they enter into the system that's like humble yourself and it's just very, I'm like, I'm addicted to this book, like seven chapters in one day. It was, it's so good. Thank you for sharing. I'll definitely tweet that out as well. Um, that's, that's, that's awesome. I, I love that. I, I've, I, in the chat, I've shared my new favorite beers. 
athletic brewing company makes non alcohol it makes alcohol free beer i'm loving it right now so <laughs> athletic brewing company they make great yeah, merchandise that's kind of how i found this book i didn't realize that sober curious was something that was trending right now and um i found like these dietitians that they're called the sober dietitians and they're creating because a lot of non-alcoholic drinks really rely on like high sugar content so they're trying to like find this place where it's like not so high sugar but also like you feel like you're having an adult beverage type of situation um but yeah sober curious movement very interesting stuff love that thank you elise yeah anybody else want to chime in Anybody else want to share what they're up to this summer? <laughs> and has a visitor as well. Hey, and visitor. All right, well, at this time, I'll say, don't forget to hit subscribe, buy the merch, smash that like button. Um, have a wonderful summer. I'm here. If you want to hang up, that's, that's fine. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Um, but hopefully our paths will cross professionally at some point. Have a great summer, at least. Thank you for sharing that. Go to me. <laughs> and I want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Andy. My, you know, I'm not talking that much because my brain is full because you gave us so much information. So a lot, lot to think about. But uh, thank you. We will upload um, this onto you, um, our website, epew dash cp.weebly.com so you'll have access to it later as well but i mean i can't thank you enough for all you shared with us today thank you judy and thank you everyone for coming thank you thank you thank you Anne. thank you kate sarah elaine thank you for attending the 48th annual elementary physical education workshop we're glad you were here Please follow us on our social media platforms. EPEW can be found on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Please check out our website for links to more great sessions. Just go to epew-cp.weebly.com and click on the virtual EPEW 2021 tab at the top and scroll down. EPEW 2021 Educators Assemble would not be possible without the support and dedication from the amazing EPW committee. The committee has been hard at work for months preparing for this workshop. Thank you to Linda McGee, Barbara Gratton, Scott Wilson, Stephanie Sandino, Julie Miller, Jessica Monlux, Kayla Aylman, Shelby Lozano, Andrea Chavez, Scott Townsend, and Cindy Chase. Thank you for attending EPEW, where our motto is, come to learn, leave as family.